Montgomery speaking. From the nation's capital has come a new epic of American courage and sacrifice. America's greatest adventure in polar exploration. This is the tale of men and of their willingness to endure hardship and risk life above and beyond the call of duty in the service of country and humanity. For brevity, the sequence of events has occasionally been rearranged. The President's cabinet approved the expedition. As Secretary of the Navy, James V. Forrestal explains the reasons for the enterprise. There is only one untouched reservoir of raw materials left in the world, and that's in the region known as Antarctica, an area larger than the combined area of the United States and Europe. The American government is sending a naval expedition to that region. The purpose is to train our Navy in polar operations so that it may better perform its function of preserving the peace upon the seven seas of the world. Beyond that, the American government is seeking to do its share in the discovery and the release to the world of the unknown treasures of Antarctica in the interest of all mankind. Thumbs up to this, gentlemen. The Secretary has approved our plans, confirming you, Admiral Byrd, as the officer in charge of the expedition, and you, Admiral Cruzen, as the task force commander. And we get everything we need. That makes Operation High Jump the greatest polar expedition in history. Admiral, time is going to be our greatest handicap. By the time we get through this very difficult ice pack, the summer will have ended and the fall will have set in. Never before has anyone attempted to take a fleet of thin-skinned steel ships through 300 miles or more of crushing ice pack. I have great faith in your skill, courage, and determination. Now, gentlemen. Admiral Nimitz reviews the operations plan. The expedition will comprise three groups. A central land plane group to explore the interior from Little America, and two seaplane groups, the eastern to map that half of the continental shoreline, and the western to map the opposite coast of Antarctica. After the original orders have been issued, three months of planning are needed to organize the giant venture. This is Robert Taylor speaking. At the world's greatest naval base, Norfolk, Virginia, ships of the central and eastern groups are loading. The flagship, Mount Olympus, equipped with powerful radio and radar, will serve as the leader's voice of command. Admirals Byrd and Cruzen come aboard to check staff preparations, food, fuel, and clothing for 4,000 men. Byrd greets staff officers who have fitted out the expedition. Not a few vessels, but a fleet. Officers and men, not hundreds, but thousands, and pilots by the score. The chief of staff, Captain Quackenbush, calls up the fleet's youngest recruits to meet the admirals, who name them Running Jump and High Jump. The pups are unimpressed by rank. Running jump and high jump are first arrivals from the Chinook kennels at Wanalancet, New Hampshire, where sailors are learning the art of navigating dog sleds. Everything happens to sailors. But soon they come to understand and to love the huskies. They watch their dogs carefully to see that they have enough to drink and enough to eat, and always at the right time. Dog Watch Blue Jackets practice the patient care that will keep the dogs in prime form. Not only food, daily attention to their eyes so that they may not suffer the dreaded Arctic snow blindness. And the inevitable vitamin pills. But even dogs can't escape these days of ABCD health.
boys learn all the tricks. Tickling of the throat and a pat on the nose gets the pin rolls down. The dog sleds are the small boats of the Antarctic. Each carries 600 pounds with 10 dogs hauling. Each dog's harness is tailor-made, carefully fitted to avoid the chafing that has been fatal to many a sled dog at below zero temperatures. The husky's paws are equally important. There are canine snowshoes, precisely notched for the pulling claws. In cut-down auto chassis, the sailor drivers finish training. Huskies so often have meant life itself to Admiral Bird that he calls them his Antarctic Life Insurance Company. From Norfolk, Admiral Cruzen sails aboard the Mount Olympus. His crews are a cross-section of the country's manhood. Admiral Byrd will follow later in the carrier Philippine Sea. The Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind, powerful plow horse of the expedition, backs out. The seaplane tender, Pine Island, is first to stand out to sea. Steaming south via the Panama Canal, the fleet must cover 12,000 miles to reach Antarctica. At the 100th meridian west, the groups are to separate, and the central group proceed to a rendezvous point at Scott Island. This is Van Heflin speaking. Sailing day at San Diego finds the western group helicopters practicing final pinpoint landings on the newly installed helicopter flight deck of the seaplane tender Curry Tuck. They are to serve as eyes of the fleet when it buffets through the pack ice, and when need be, to go on rescue missions. For exploration, three Martin Mariners, called PBMs, with a flight range of 3,000 miles, are spotted aboard the Curry Tuck. Ships of the Western Group will proceed 10,000 miles south to the Balleny Islands, 860 miles to the west of Little America. Aboard the Mount Olympus, now heading south in the Pacific, Admiral Cruzen gives a traditional command, and up goes the strange flag. The Jolly Roger, signifying the crossing of the equator, and authorizing the ancient shenanigans of the sea, whereby all land lovers are painfully presented at King Neptune's court. The veteran shell facts copperplate the polywogs and interiors with a mixture of cylinder oil and chewing tobacco. Next, the polywogs must kiss the bosun's belly, the only kiss they'll have for many a long month. They wind up with a dunking, and the final whacking to warm them up, officers and men alike. Wearing the whiskers of Neptunus Caninus, Ricky, the veteran husky, presides as the pups become doggy shell bags. The oncoming shadow of the Antarctic intensifies preparations. Bamboo is split for trail marker sticks. These, topped with flags, will form lifelines to guard the men against losing the trail in blinding blizzards. Small details, but vitally important in the wilderness of ice. The dogs are inoculated against infection. Now the serious business of the sea takes over. Danger menaces the fleet oiler, Kakapon. She must fuel the fleet now to lighten her cargo of four million gallons of oil. If storms strike her, plates may warp, rivets shear, and her back may be broken. And ahead are the dreaded roaring 40s. Deck parties run with hauling lines, bringing over the Cacapon's captain for a conference. The ships are still on course, forging ahead. But the Cacapon salty skippers smell storm coming. Few ships travel this lonely ocean, so there are no weather reports. We've got to finish this job fast, he roars, or we'll be caught in 